I'm Sarah and I'm so pleased that you've tuned into Proximity Conference and that you're joining us for this amazing day. I'm really gutted not to be face to face with you in a room and when we had to pull the plug on it due to the coronavirus crisis it was a really big sadness because it's something that I'd been planning and looking forward to for almost a whole year but actually isn't it amazing what um what creativity and what opportunity can come out of a crisis and so instead of being face to face with you in a room I get to be looking at my screen in my living room uh, we've cleared the toys away and uh, I've actually got nicely dressed for the first time in weeks um just to spend a bit of time with you and to tell you a little bit about this thing called Eden I appreciate many of you might have tuned into this conference and you really have got no idea what the Eden network is you've never heard of us before you're not sure what this whole proximity thing is about so I just wanted to take the opportunity to spend a few minutes telling you who we are what drives us what our vision is um, and really what sets us apart as a missional movement and perhaps one of the most exciting missional movements that are that's active today um, I remember the first time that I heard about Eden. I was a teenager. I was growing up on a farm in rural North Yorkshire. And I heard about all these incredible people who moved into this um, place called Bench Hill in Withenshaw, which at the time was the uh, most deprived estate, the most deprived ward in the whole of Britain. And these hordes of young, enthusiastic Christians moved in and they lived in the community and they loved their neighbours and they served the young people and they did such incredible things and they're such role models to me looking up to them and thinking wow one day could my life make that kind of difference could I be involved with something like that and over the years I flirted with the idea I moved to Manchester came here to study and got involved in a local church and all the time kind of kept my eye on this movement kept my eye on this group of people saw Eden growing across Manchester saw Eden moving into different cities across the nation and and, and ultimately into different nations as well and and saw this movement of of mission-minded people and um, really starting to take ground for the kingdom really starting to make a difference and I was fascinated as an observer and I was challenged in my heart and in my soul and in my spirit to to consider what would that look like for me and I decided that a mission for me looked like moving abroad and moved out to Kenya for a bit with my husband and then we got back here and uh, I just, there was something about moving back to Britain and feeling like God had called us back to this place and we'd had this prophetic word that we would find the community of our calling and when we got back here we, we realised that we couldn't put it off any longer and that really Eden was the thing for us. So we joined up in 2012, we've lived here on the Merseybank estate in South Manchester ever since and it is been a privilege a blessing a pain a challenge and all sorts of different things to be living here and to be part of this network but it's something that I hold dearly and it's something that I believe strongly in and I really want to share with you a few of the the hallmarks of our mission a few of the the reasons why we do this the things that we think are important and the things that I think if you knew you might consider joining in with us as well so I'm going to tell you about three things that are really key to us at Eden. And the first thing is the gospel. Gospel, it just means good news, doesn't it? We believe firmly, strongly and wholeheartedly that the gospel is good news, not just for me, not just for you, not just for everyone who's got access to this conference, but for anybody and everybody, and particularly for those who've got it toughest, who've had a tough start in life, who've had disappointment, who've had frustration, who've had pain, who've whose society overlooks. A couple of months ago, I did some teaching with a bunch of students and I asked them what they immediately thought of when I said the word inner city and council estate. And they just listed this whole raft of things, negative stories, negative words, negative terms. And I asked them where that came from and they just kind of shrugged a bit and went, wow, that's 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 what it's like isn't it that's how it is you know some people are just you know not any good some places are just god forsaken and it was one of the terms that somebody used and it really struck me that there's such a narrative in our society there's such a story there's such a stigma attached to some people and some places we're so prejudiced against people who've got it tough against communities that are, um, that suffer from from violence from criminality from from historic and sustained poverty and so 
I really want to be part of bringing good news to those places. And I believe that's what Jesus set out to do. He was found eating with tax collectors. He was found eating with fishermen. He was found eating and spending his time with people that society would have been suspicious of, would have been rejecting, would really have held no value for. And yet he, they were the people that Jesus went to. This gospel is good news for the poor. And so I want to be telling it to the poor. I want to be going to the poor and not just material poor, because that's, you know, that's one thing, but um, poor in spirit, poor in, poor in relationship, poor in many different areas. And I appreciate that covers a broad swathe of society, but particularly in some of these communities that we call our homes. We know that the gospel provides great news. It provides freedom, freedom from addiction, freedom from historic life choices, freedom from abuse, freedom from patterns and, and, and ways of thinking and attitudes. And, and one of my friends recently, she said, she found herself back in the same situation that she'd been in a year previously when she was in the pits of depression. And she said, a year on with Jesus in my life, I'm in the same place physically, but I'm in a whole different place spiritually because she knows the power of God in a situation. Even if the situation itself doesn't change, even if she doesn't do what society tells her to move out and, and move up and move on, um, God is present in her life, making a fantastic difference where she is and what she's doing. You know, many of the, the amazing missional movements, the, the major revivals in our country started on the margins. And I firmly believe that that is the place where God is going to pour out his spirit again in these days. He loves our communities. He loves these places that are forgotten, not just by society, but often sadly by the church as well. When you look at church planting movements, when you look at thriving churches, more often than not, they're in cities, they're in student areas, they're in affluent suburbs where people want to be and people want to stay and people aspire to get to. Nobody, or very few I should say, people are planting churches into estates and that needs to change. You know, it might seem small, it might seem hidden, it might seem to be thankless work and yet the fruit is incredible and the honour and the privilege is all ours and it just takes you to get involved and to get stuck in to begin to realise that and to have your mind shifted and your mind changed. You know, the gospel talks about salvation for the individual and that is not... Um, a small thing that is a massive part of what we preach but also the gospel talks about the restoration of community the restoration of society the restoration of all things I love that vision in Revelation 4 um, when John sorry Revelation 21 verse 4 when 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 John speaks out um, the new heaven and the new earth the place where there'll be no more mourning no more crying every tear will be washed away because God is making all things new and we believe that in bringing um, his kingdom here and, and in being witnesses to him and in being and showing and talking about who he is to our neighbours, then actually we're contributing to him making things new, to that, that eventual place where we will rest, where we will land, where there is no more of this pain, no more of this suffering, no more of this frustration. So we hold tight to the gospel, to the truth that Jesus in his life and his death and his resurrection paid the price for us, prayed the cost for us, gave us a way to be free, gave us a way to live differently, gave us access to it, the Holy Spirit in which can change our lives, whatever situation we find ourselves in, that is our number one priority. The second thing that we hold dearly to is the concept of sacrifice. You know, for many of us, society will tell us that there is a pattern or a path to a good life. You go to school, you get some good grades. Perhaps you get to university, you get some more good grades, you get a job, you meet the man or woman of your dreams, you get married, you have some kids, you buy a nice house, you move out to the suburbs so that the kids get a better school. And it's all about upward, upward, upward. And it's all about comfort and it's all about privilege. And it's about looking after myself, my interests and those nearest and dearest to me. And yet, when we follow Jesus, and this whole conference is called Come Follow Me, he doesn't call us just to, to look after ourselves. He calls us to do what he did. He calls us to follow him. He calls us to go to the places he would go. He calls us to be with the people that he would be with us, be with. And he calls us to lay it all down for him. 
We need to be prepared, as Paul says in Romans chapter 12, to be living sacrifices, to daily sacrifice our wants, our needs, our preferences, our comforts for him and for his 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 commands for his for his calling on our life you know he had no place to lay his head he had no um status he had no financial um you know stability or security he had uh, no family in this in the typical sense of a wife and kids um and yet he calls us to sacrifice to follow him to put him and his will first Many people think that the sacrifice for us is moving into communities that are a little bit more exciting than the average community, that is moving to a place where perhaps it's not so secure or our neighbours might have some kind of interesting trade going on or, you know, there might be crime or there might be racism or there might be violence and all these different things. Um, And actually, I've learned that that isn't the sacrifice that's often the privilege to be part of this community, to be part of this movement, to be living in these places. The sacrifice is something that happens inside me on a daily and a weekly and a monthly basis where every time I feel tempted to do the easy thing, to do the comfortable thing, to do the thing that makes me feel better, I have to say again, no God, let me follow you. Let me put you first. Who would you want to interrupt my day today? Who would you send me out to? Who would you have me reach on this day in this situation the living sacrifice is a daily sacrifice a daily choice to follow him and the third thing is community we believe firmly in community you know in Luke 10 um, verse 27 and also in Mark and Matthew Jesus is asked what the greatest commandment is and he says the greatest commandment is this to love the Lord your God with all your heart your soul your mind and your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself Christianity, the faith of following Jesus, is not an individual pursuit. It's a community-based approach to life. Other people are always needed. Other people are always important. Other people are key to living a life with God and to reaching people. We can't do it by ourselves. Um, William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, is one of our fantastic great heroes here at Eden. And uh, as he was dying, as he was um, on his, you know, unwell, there was a a conference going on, a rally that he was unable to get to. And he was asked, would you send a message of encouragement to the preachers? And he sent a telegram. And uh, back in those days, he had to pay, put a letter. um, And he sent a really short telegram. And all it said on it was the word others. The focus of the salvation was so much about reaching others. You know, I've I've heard it said, and I'm sure you have too, that the church is the only organisation that exists for the benefit of the people outside it, for the people who are not its members. And so um, really that's what we're here for. We're, We're here for our communities. We're here for other people. We're not here for ourselves. We're not here to serve our own purposes. We're here to serve God and to make a difference and to bring his kingdom that little bit nearer. You know, the church in Britain today tragically does not represent the um, makeup of British society today. It's said that 81% of people in the church in Britain today have a higher education. That means they've got a degree. That means they've had um, the, the ability to study. That means they probably work in some kind of um, middle or higher grade job and yet within our country only 27% of people have actually been to university that's a huge mismatch and obviously that's just one perspective on it but our church is not full of people from our estates our churches are full of people that are middle class that are wealthy that are upwardly mobile that have affluence and security at the heart of who they are and that's a massive problem for me and I hope that's a massive problem for you we set out to transform the face of the church by enabling the church to reach the communities where Jesus is needed most where it's a daily challenge but it's also a daily privilege to serve and where community really is at the heart of everything that we do there are a bunch of ways that we work as Eden really you know specifically when we're setting up a team when we're we're wanting to to start a new project we have um, a bunch of things that have to be in place we don't just start stuff anywhere we don't just work with anybody although we do work with a really broad range of churches in a broad range of places. But I just want to tell you briefly about the five things that are really non-negotiable. 
when it comes to being part of Eden. And they are that we always work in partnership with a local church. You heard me say we want the church to change. We want the, the face of the church to be um, transformed. And and we do. Uh, we want to support the local church. And that's why we work with the church, because we believe the church has stability. We believe the church has permission, has authority to work in an area. And there's often already vision. There's often already some people praying in the places that we go to. And we really get alongside and we help. We don't we don't often start stuff off our own backs. We get alongside people, we help them and we support them. So we always work in partnership with the local church. The second thing that we do is we always move into communities that are in the bottom 10% when it comes to the indices of multiple deprivation. And if you've never heard of that, it's just a measure that our government has, um, which helps us to know which are the toughest places to live in our country. Where is it that crime is highest? Where is it that income is lowest? Where is it that job security is at its least? Where is it that educational attainment is not so great? You know, often we can just look at these places and know them but um, we really are called and we feel really strongly that we want to go to the toughest places loads of people ring me up and say we want Eden here we want Eden here we want it in our church and I often have to say to people please love your neighbours love your community but we can't come to you we have to be focused on the toughest on the hardest to reach that's our calling that's our mandate the third thing that we always insist on is that our teams live in the communities. They have homes in the heart of the community. It's not enough for us that our, our people work in a community, that they spend a bit of their time there. It has to be wholehearted, whole life approach to mission. It's only when you live in a community, it's only when you spend your time there that it makes a massive difference. Um, that when you, you get to know people quicker, you get to know relationships quicker, you know, your doctors is their doctors, your shop is their shop. You become a part of that community by living and dwelling in that place. The fourth thing is that we have a focus on young people. And uh, we started off as a youth movement. We started off primarily to reach the young people. And as I said, often as it happens, as movements get older, we have evolved and we do reach whole communities now, but we still have a special place in our heart for young people. We still wanna see that younger generation um, loved well and cared for well and given opportunities to to know who they are and to know whose they are. So we'll be found on the streets, walking around doing detached youth work, we'll be found doing youth groups, we'll be found doing craft and gardening and anything and everything that we can do to reach and to help and to bless and to, and to encourage and to get alongside the young people in our communities and help them be everything that God created them to be. And finally, the fifth thing is that we are a network and the network, the Eden network, as it is at the moment, is around 35, 40 different groups and, and teams spread around the UK and in, internationally. And together, we strengthen each other. Together, we encourage one another. You know, often this can be tough work. Often you can feel isolated. You can feel alone. You can feel at sea. You can feel confused or burnt out or frustrated or confused. I said confused. Um, you can feel like you're the only person feeling these things. And, you know, that is one of the reasons I'm gutted that we're not having proximity because... In a, in a place because often um, when we all come together people from around the nation who are working in tough communities we spend a lot of time going I feel this and somebody else can come up to us and go yeah me too and I love that yeah me too part of being a network because we get it we get each other we get the joys we get the challenges but I am um, but that's not that's not what's happening today unfortunately um, but the network is crucial because we've got each other's backs, because we've got strengths that we can share with each other, we've got experience, we've got years of history of doing this kind of thing, and we are stronger and better together. So everyone who joins Eden becomes part of the network, and we expect them um, to, to give to us uh, of their time and their talents and their training and their gifts, and we in turn give back to them everything and anything that we can find that will bless them, that will encourage them, that will help them to do this incredible work so that was just a little bit about how we do Eden um 
Eden is is a team pursuit. You know, we don't believe in sending individuals into communities. We don't believe in uh, just making one person responsible for everything. We want people to be placed in teams. We saw that Jesus worked with 12 people and that's an ideal number, isn't it? That's a number where we can be strong relationally with each other. We can know each other well, but also we can get some jobs done because there's plenty of us. Um, there's, ta- there's different talents in the group. There's different abilities. There's different strengths and weaknesses, perspectives. Um, ages and stages and that's why we're all about team we think that um, yeah God works through groups of people and actually we can model as a team how um, Christian community should look as well as we love each other in our team that has an effect on our community because people see that people see how we love people see how we look after each other people see how we've got each other's backs and how we we reach out to each other and and are in and out of each other's houses and bring up each other's kids and support each other through the tough stuff um and when it comes to teams we've got we've got an approach really which looks to recruit people from different places different backgrounds different stages and ages we don't just want a team that's just one type of person or a bunch of people who've just moved in ideally for for us a team is a, a bunch of people who in normal life may never have worked together but actually in God's kingdom in this this Christian way that we live um he's put together and he's working with and in and through And so we've got three different types of people that we would think about being part of our teams and they are relocators. So people who move into a community, perhaps it's never been their place of residence, perhaps they've never known anything like it um, and they come in as outsiders. That was very much our experience. You know, I'm a farm girl from Yorkshire, my husband's from the Midlands. Um, We'd been living in Manchester for years, but we, we are definitely outsiders in our community I have a friend who calls me her posh friend and I have to keep telling her I'm not posh um but she says I am and so this is the argument that we have all the time um but relocators they come with energy they come with purpose and often they come with a high sense of God's call into a place because they've given up everything to be there because they've laid aside their other plans because they've they've given up living in a different place and they've chosen to move to this community wherever it might be and calling is absolutely key when it comes to Eden we need to know that God's called us we need to know that God wants us in this place because when the going gets tough we need to have a reason to stay because sometimes it can be rough it can be hard there can be seasons which are traumatic seasons which are exhausting and we can easily want to throw in the towel and give up and that's where the network can support us by giving us resources and encouragement and that's where our team can support us and that's ultimately where we know that our our calling our our test our what it is that God's spoken to us um, is true. That's what we hold on to when we find it tested and challenged and we're not sure what to do about it. The second group of people that we look to join Eden would be what we call returners. So people who've grown up in a community who then um, have moved away, you know, maybe they've gone away to study, maybe they've got a good job, maybe they've just gone somewhere else for whatever reason and God calls them back. And these are often the funniest people to deal with because often they'll have said to God oh God I'll go anywhere you want me to go but I'll never go there I'll never send never send me back there and it's always fascinating when um when God does a number a number on people and say no I want you to go back there because you've got relationships and people know you and people can see the difference people can see the change people can see what I have done in you and you will show my story as well as tell my story And the third group of people that we look at when it comes to joining Eden are Remainers. And these are the the best people. These are the most exciting people. These are the people that we don't talk about nearly enough. These are the people who are from the community. These are the people who've always been there. These are the people who God is already working through, who've faithfully prayed, who've come to faith in the, the early days of an Eden team perhaps the people who are authentic um community people who have come to know jesus who've seen him transforming them and again whose lives tell a story whose history is known who are almost like visual signs of who god is and what he can do and they are 
so helpful and so essential to any Eden team in translating between the community and these like random people who've moved in hoping to do some good stuff. Um, I love everybody on our team deeply, but I have a special place in my heart for all those who were here before me, who were praying long and hard before I got here, and um, who can just tell me every now and then, Sarah, you've got it wrong. Wind your neck in, shut up with your daft posh ideas, this is how it is, um, and it's such a blessing and such an honour, um, and it's so good to have that honesty and that that reality of people who just every now and then tell you uh, to get over yourself. And uh, yeah, so those are those are the people that we have joined Eden. And I just want to share with you one quick Bible passage that always inspires me and helps me when I think about this. So let me just grab my Bible. Um, we're going to look at uh, Matthew chapter 13 verses, reading from verse 31. And it says this, he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 30 kilograms of flour until it worked all through the dough. This parable that Jesus tells about the kingdom um, talks about two tiny little substances, the mustard seed and the yeast, two things that are small, that are insignificant, and yet within them is great power. Yet within them is the power to transform the, the whole atmosphere, the whole environment around them. But they have to be laid down, they have to be mixed in, they have to give up their unique properties in order to transform that which is around them and I always find that so amazing the mustard seed has to be buried in the ground for the tree to flourish the yeast has to be mixed into the bread mixture for the rise to be taken and for that whole mixture to be affected and I think that's a really amazing parallel when it comes to what we do. We need to be mixed into community. We need to be sown into the ground of the places that we are, are sent to, that we are called to, that we live in, that we're from, wherever it is. Um, and we need to know that in so doing, that isn't a waste. That isn't, that isn't foolishness, which it can sometimes feel like on the bad days when you, you look at everything and you think, oh, what's this achieved and what's happening here and why is it all going wrong? We need to know and we need to remember that when something lays down its life, when something gives up, when something sacrifices itself, it has the power to transform the atmosphere and the environment around it. Perhaps not in the timing that we would have it, perhaps not in the way that we would imagine it, and yet, it happens and it's happening and we can see it if we if we stick around long enough if we pray if we seek if we look if we ask if we knock if we faithfully sow and lay ourselves down and mix ourselves in the change will come the transformation will come not through our own efforts but through the holy spirit in us working in and through us and having his way through a life surrendered to him through a, a heart obedient to him he will make all the difference so I hope I've given you a, a bit of an overview of our movement, a bit of a, a, a bit of a, a picture of what it is that drives us, that motivates us. When people ask me, why would I join Eden? My answer to them often is, why would you not? Like, for me, this just seems like the best way of following Jesus. It seems like the only way. And, and he really got me on it you know all those years of, of watching other people do it all those years of reading the stories all those years have been inspired uh, and eventually that calling on my life that calling from him was so clear that I couldn't ignore it any longer and perhaps that's you you know perhaps God is speaking to you and he's saying give up now stop fighting come and join these people come and join this thing and maybe it's not joining us specifically maybe it's joining some other people who are doing something like it or maybe it's getting involved in your church but I don't want to. I don't want to rule out joining Eden for you. You know, perhaps you're an individual watching this. Perhaps you're a group of friends. Perhaps you're a family, and you feel that tug and you feel that dissatisfaction with the way your life is at the moment. You start to wonder: Am I sacrificing daily? Am I laying down my life? Am I seeing God move through me? 
then maybe you want to consider joining us head over to our website joineden.org and we'd love to hear more from you perhaps you're a church leader watching this and you think i want one of these bunches of crazy guys i've got a few people i've got a bit of money i've got a bit of vision and i want to see this in my church then drop us a line we're always looking for new partners but only if you're in the bottom 10 percent um if you're somewhere else then god bless you get in touch and we'll share some ideas with you and we'll do what we can for you but um but if you're in some of the toughest communities in britain today or worldwide for that matter get in touch we love to pray with you to listen with you to walk with you and see how we might help you and how we might reach your community together please do keep in touch please if you've got any questions get in touch we'd love to hear from you we're so grateful that you've joined us today and we really are blessed by this time together so thank you and hope to see you again bye